Well, it's good to be back. I was gone the month of May, and so it's, it's nice to be here. Um, and well, the first service gave me standing ovation, through money. I don't know what's... Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I, I do have to confess, I still have a little bit of bitterness. My family is in Missouri. They are there, and they're going to be going to Six Flags. They're going to the lake, and they're going to be riding on a sea do and all kinds of stuff like that, and I'm trying to get over some of that. So if I'm angry this morning, it's not you, it's me, all right? Uh, usually it's the other way around. Um, <laughs> When you think of church, uh, we're starting a series called Real Church. And when you think of church, you probably think of a lot of different things. Most often, I think, uh, we probably think of buildings. And when you think of church building, you probably think of something like this first picture. Um, it's like the, the traditional church that we see in our country today. And, you know, it's, it's this real nice thing. And if you've ever been to Europe, you'll see some even nicer churches. You know, they kind of look like this. And you just, you know, you see buildings like that, and it's like, oh, wow. And then you go and look at ours, and you're like, oh, wow. And, you know, stuff like that happens. Um, the very first church buildings were built around 323 AD. The, the Roman emperor um, made Christianity the official religion of Rome. And so after that, they started building church buildings, and they started looking like the Roman architecture of the time. And so uh, the first picture we have is kind of like the, looking down at a floor plan. It's a two church building side by side. And the setup was a little bit different. Uh, it, it, it says the Ambos. That's the place where I preach from. Okay, And we're going to see how that changes in a little bit. The altar, that's where you serve communion from. And so, kind of crazy, long, narrow hallway. Uh, I would preach here. Uh, there would be seats behind me. The, the altar, where they had communion kind of prepped and stuff, kind of in the middle of the congregation. Uh, but church architecture changed. Uh, it went on. And someone got real spiritual and said, we can't have a long, narrow hallway to preach from, you know, to have services in. We need to have more of a cross. And so they put little wings on both sides, so when you look down, it, it looked like a cross. And then uh, preachers started getting a big head. And not that they ever do that. Um, and so they would preach from this pulpit, and it's called other things and places. And so they preached from this place, and it was kind of a nice-looking thing. And if you got up and read Scripture or did announcement and stuff, you are over on the other side, the lectern. You know, they're just kind of over there, okay? Not near as important. Uh, church architecture kept changing. Um, and some and, and different parts of the world kind of did different things. And so all the stuff at, at one point was just kind of in the middle. So kind of a square with me and the place they serve communion from right there in the middle of everything. Uh, it changed some, uh, just, another, just another view. Uh, they had circle all the way around, okay? The, there's a choir area, communion right in the middle. And so church architecture, all different kinds of things. And I'm saying that because of this. Jesus died, rose from the dead, about 33 AD. The first buildings that were dedicated to churches happened around 323 AD. So for the first 300 years that the church met, they didn't have like a church architecture, church buildings. When the followers of Jesus got together, it was just wherever they could find a place. I mean, when you read through the book of Acts, it's not like, well, go to the church building because it didn't exist. They just met wherever they could. It says that they met in the upper room. They met in the temple courts, in the courtyards in the temple. Uh, they met in people's houses. Uh, there's a place called Solomon's Colonnade, a very specific place in the temple. Uh, they met in synagogues. Uh, they met near a river. Okay? They didn't have a church building. The only place they could find was near, the, near a river, in lecture halls, in rented houses, uh, just wherever they could find a place. Scottsdale Christian Church, we've met in, in three places that I know of. As we've kind of looked through our history, we know three different locations that we've met. And ultimately, it doesn't matter. Because where the church meets is not the issue. Because when you look at the church, the word in the Bible that we use for church is ecclesia. And the word ecclesia just means a gathering or an assembly. And it was pretty generic at the time. And so, because uh, people can gather or assemble for all kinds of reasons. But for the church, it was people who were getting together whose lives had been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. You know, as you read through the Bible, you see that the gathering, the group of people who are meeting together for Jesus, it's pretty obvious what we're supposed to be doing. 
the way we've defined it here at this church is, is Scottsdale Christian Church. Our purpose is, is to lead you to connect with Jesus Christ. That's our primary purpose. But then after you connect with him, we want to equip you to live your faith and then send you to impact your world. And we get those purposes from the Bible. Again, when we think of church, we think of this building, this structure, and that's not what it is. The church is the gathering of people. It's the people who are here to worship God and to, to share about Jesus Christ. That's the church. And so this summer, uh, for the next couple months, we're going to look at the real church. Not all this stuff, not just the buildings and stuff. We're going to do, get rid of some other junk that has come up uh, to be associated with the church. And we want to be the real church. Be the people, the gathering, who are the real church. Well, what does that look like? What is that supposed to be? That's what we're going to study. And we're going to start at the beginning in Acts chapter 1 this morning. So if you have a Bible, turn to Acts 1. If you don't, there should be uh, some of the chairs in front of you. It's page 770 in those. If you don't have a phone or something like that, you can look in your own Bible. It's, uh, it's kind of toward the end of the Bible, after the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts. While you're looking that up, I just want to just give you a little background information. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are stories about the life of Jesus. They're kind of the biographies of Jesus. The book of Acts comes next, and it tells what happened next. You know, Jesus did all these things. He went, to he went up to heaven. Then what? Well, the book of Acts tells us what those followers of his did. So Acts chapter 1, we'll start right there in the beginning. And I'm going to start reading with uh, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. The first place we need to start is we need to grasp the truth about Jesus. We need to grasp the truth. And so the, the, uh, Luke writes this book, the book of Acts, and he writes it for this reason. He says, uh, in my former book, Theophilus, I began to write about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. In my former book, what's that? Well, if you read Luke chapter 1, the, here is Luke writing, and this is what he says in Luke chapter 1 about why he wrote the book of Luke. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that, that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. When it came to Jesus, people were talking and writing all kinds of stuff about Jesus. And, and so Luke said, a lot of people have done this. And then he says this, Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. Uh, Luke writes and says, hey, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's been written, and so I have carefully investigated. I went out, I did a research project, I went and did a studies, I, I, I looked and, and found the truth and you know, went to the primary sources, so that you would know with certainty the things that you've been taught. That you would know for certain the stuff that I've been telling you about Jesus so you'd know it's true. That's why I went and did this stuff, so, so that you would understand. That's what Luke writes, so that we can be certain. And that's the same thing that we need to do. We need to grasp the truth about Jesus Christ. Because the Bible is full of stuff about God. It's full of, about stuff that the, the way that we need to live. The Bible is full of stuff about Jesus and about the church, all kinds of stuff out there. With all that information, what, if you boil it down, what's the most important stuff? It's the most important, it's, it's the stuff about Jesus Christ. The early church understood that. They understood there's a lot. As they were trying to teach people and preach to people, they said, man, we narrowed down. They kind of came up with a little song or a saying uh, that they passed on in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15 says this. Paul writes and says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Jesus died for our sins, just like it was uh, prophesied in the Old Testament. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Not only did Jesus die and was buried, but he rose, and then he started showing up to Peter. 
to, to people, Peter, the, the, the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Paul writes and says, Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, he, he rose again, he started showing up to people. Uh, some of those people are still alive. He said, if you don't believe me, if you don't trust me, go have a conversation with them. As a matter of fact, why don't you do that? Why don't you go talk to this person, ask them about Jesus and, and about his resurrection, his appearances, talk to that person, and then go talk to that person over there. See if the stories don't match up. If they don't, forget all this because it's junk. But if they do, if they do match up, that's important. Because in the history of the world, God sent his son one time. In the history of the world, his son died for our sins. And so all the things that we've done wrong, Jesus Christ died for those things. He paid the price for our sins so we could be in a relationship with God. The Bible says that's, that's the most important part. At our church, that's the most important part. We want you to understand that you can have a relationship with God, but it comes through Jesus Christ. Out of all the things that you see, out of all the things that you hear, out of all the things that you are, that's the thing that you need to grasp. That's the truth. That's what sets Christianity apart from all the other religions out there. That's what sets this, all this stuff. It's, it's that Jesus died for our sins. If, if you don't understand the resurrection and the importance of that, I, man, go online, check out some stuff. Uh, go to websites by either uh, Lee Strobel, S-T-R-O-B-E-L, or uh, Josh McDowell. Go on websites and see the importance of the resurrection and, it, and the, the, the evidence for the resurrection. Our whole calendar is centered on the fact that Jesus was on this earth. That's what we count. You know, we're in the year 2014, 2014 years since Jesus showed up. Everything centers around Jesus. And the thing is this, you can't just grasp the truth about Jesus with your head. At some point, it's got to get down into your heart. And I think that the more that you study the Gospels, the more you see the, the power of the resurrection, the more it gets down into your heart. And the more the truth about Jesus gets in there, the more then that we need to seek the Spirit. We need to seek the Holy Spirit, the, second part of the, the third part of God. Seek the Spirit. Here in, in verse 4, Luke is continuing to write, and he says this. Uh, on one occasion, Jesus gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For ba John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, you need to wait here in Jerusalem. He told his apostles, wait in Jerusalem um, until the Holy Spirit comes. It's the same thing that Jesus had told them before, to, to watch for the Holy Spirit. Back in uh, John 14, uh, Jesus was telling his apostles this. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you, you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Here's the deal. Jesus was on this earth because he wanted us to see, get a picture of who God is. Because when we think about God, you know, we all have some pictures in our mind about who God is and, and, and what he's like. Part of the reason Jesus came was so that we can get a, a real firm, objective picture. This is what God looks like in the flesh. And so when he interacts with people, when he does things, this is what God would do. This is God in the flesh. The problem with Jesus coming in the form of a person, he was very limited. And he still did all kinds of miracles and stuff like that, but he was limited. He was limited because he could only have a conversation with so many people at a, at a, at a time. You know, if you've tried to have a conversation with two or three people, <laughs> you kind of get lost, don't you? And if you are just real popular and, and stuff like that, crowds of people want to be around you. That's what happened with Jesus. And so he, he, never, he never traveled more than about 100 miles from where he grew up. He was limited because he was in a body. And so because of that limitation, God said, you know what? I wanted to be closer, so I became, as a person, I wanted to be even closer still. 
And Jesus, when he went back up to heaven, he said, I'm going to heaven, so now the counselor, the Holy Spirit, can live in you. As you read through the Bible, you'll see that the Holy Spirit has always been active. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and, and be with people. The difference now is the Holy Spirit lives inside of people. When you become a Christian, when you're baptized into Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit starts living inside of you. That's a pretty cool thing. Because when you think of the greatness of God, when you look at the universe that he's made and how huge and big it is, the, the, the thought that God had the way he created that universe, how big he has to be, and the fact that he wants to live inside of us, that's crazy. I mean, it'd be like going out here to one of these anthills, you know, just digging up that anthill, seeing all those ants just going crazy because you dig up the thing, right? And saying, you know what? I want to live inside of those ants. <laughs> I mean, that's how tiny we are in comparison to God <laughs> at best. And God's saying, I want to live inside of them. That's the kind of relationship God wants with us. And there are times then I think that, that we, we seek after God, but there's a lot of times that we get distracted. And so we grasp the truth about Jesus, but we need to continue to seek the Spirit. We need to seek God's Spirit today. For the disciples, Jesus said, okay, just wait in Jerusalem. He's coming to you. For us today, he may be living inside of us, but I think that at times we don't always seek after him. And we need to keep seeking him. Well, how does that work? How, how, do, how do we do that? How do we seek the Spirit? Well, here are some, some ways that I do, some things I do. It, it's by no means all the ways, and you seeking the Spirit may not look exactly like me, and that's okay. But here are some things I do. Uh, some, I, I, I try and take a prayer walk every day. Uh, that sounds pretty spiritual, doesn't it? <laughs> Taking a prayer walk means leaving my house, going walking around the park, and going home. It's about two miles. Uh, my, I, as, I, as I walk, uh, sometimes I'm talking out loud, okay? I try not to talk real loud because I don't want to freak my neighbors out too much, you know? Um, but I just walk and say, okay, God, what do you got today? You know, where, what's going on today? And there, as, I'm, as I'm walking and I'm talking, there are times that I'm just talking a bunch and a bunch and a bunch, and there are times I don't say anything. I mean, there are times, I mean, honestly, I am counting the steps as I walk in, in the cracks in the sidewalk, and I'm counting how many steps it takes to do each one, because I get off center. I get distracted. But there are times that I just keep coming back to God and say, okay, God, you know, and, and it, it's like he leads me in the thoughts that I have, and it helps me sort through my thoughts and the experiences of the day, and it helps me to get centered and, and focused on him. It's not a continual conversation for the, the, for the whole two miles, but it's a time that I can be disconnected from electronics. It's a time I can be disconnected from other people, and it's just me and him. Sometimes there's a lot of conversation that happens. Sometimes almost none. That's one of the things that I do. Um, another thing I do is reading the Bible. Uh, beyond being my occupation, it, it's something I do. And, and, you know, there have been times that I've, I've, I've been trying to read the Bible for distance, you know, trying to read the entire Bible in 90 days or read the entire Bible this year or, or read this whole book and stuff like that. Right now, I'm in a, in a season where I'm reading a, a passage, a passage maybe one to six verses somewhere in there, you know, and I'm not trying to go for distance. I'm really trying to get a really deep grasp on what this thing is saying, and I may just think about that one passage all day long and just, and just try and focus on that. That's how I'm reading parts of the Bible right now. If you don't know where to start, um, see if there's a topic that you really care about, something that you're dealing with right now, and see everything the Bible has to say about that. Um, if you're not just having something big, just pick a book of the Bible. Try and figure out why in the world that, that book is in the Bible and what it has to do with you right now. Read it in that way. I know some of you struggle reading the Bible. You just struggle reading. It's just hard for you to do. Um, there's a couple things you can do. Number one, put an app on your phone because those things will read to you. How convenient is that? Okay, in the entire history of the world, all the ADD that's happening with people now and you have people that read to you for free. How cool is that? If, that, if you struggle with that, uh, there are some videos. Uh, I know that the book of Matthew, the book of John, and the book of Acts are on video. They're on DVD, and you can just sit there and watch the thing, and it's, it's word for word. 
Okay, th- those, those do exist. I've seen them out there. I don't care what it is. I don't care how you're getting into the Bible. You got to get into the Bible. If you want to seek the Spirit, I mean, if, if you really believe this stuff about Jesus Christ and you really want to seek that relationship with him, then you need to spend some time praying and talking to God, but you need to spend some time listening. And the, the primary way we listen to God is when we read the Bible. Uh, there are other things that you can do. Uh, Christian music, historically, I have not been a big fan of Christian music. Um, just not there. Just hated it. Uh, I thought it was junk. Um, in the last year and a half, totally changed. Uh, it's really hard for me to listen to anything besides Christian music right now. It drives me crazy because uh, it's, it's just so different from what I used to be. But, but hearing Christian music and, and having God speak through the words of those people that have put those songs together, man, I'll tell you what, it's a big, big, big deal in my life right now. Those are some ways, places to start. Because if you really believe this stuff about Jesus Christ, that he really died for your sins, at some point that needs to have an impact on you. And at some point you need to seek the Spirit just like Jesus told the apostles to. And if you grasp the truth truth about Jesus and you seek his Spirit, then you're going to be able to expand God's kingdom. Be able to expand God's kingdom. Look there in verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is kind of doing a wrap up with his apostles and talking to him. And they they ask him, okay, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Basically, they're asking, are you going to kick the Romans out? And now we'll be our own country again. And Jesus is like, Dude, seriously, how many times do I have to tell you this? I'm not here to kick the Romans out, okay? My kingdom, totally different kingdom. My kingdom is not limited to the country of Israel. My my kingdom is for the entire world. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how you grew up. It doesn't matter what language you speak. God's kingdom for the whole world. You guys' picture is way too small. You're driving me crazy. I'm taking off. That's it. He did leave very quickly after that. He didn't say the other part. Um, but he said this, but when the Spirit comes on you, you'll receive power. You'll be my witnesses. You're going to be able to share what God has done in your life. And God calls us to do the same thing. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. We're not on this earth to build up our kingdoms. That's not why we're here. But when we understand who Jesus is and we're seeking the Spirit in our life, we're going to be expanding God's kingdom because you can't help it. If you're really seeking God's kingdom in your life, if you're really trying to know him better and live for him, it's going to overflow. And people are going to start looking at you and going, what in the world is up? You are acting so different than you used to. I started taking my walk with God seriously. I started living these things out. I started caring about God. I started examining my life and saying, you know what? I was building my kingdom and not God's. And when you get to that point, I'll tell you what, people around you just go, dude, what's going on? God has called us to expand his kingdom. Well, what does that mean and, and how do we live that out? Well, uh, one thing, one easy way, invite people to church. I mean, this is the place where God's word is proclaimed most often. And so invite people to church. Um, you know, for me, um, I, I, I've been trying to work at restaurants as far as uh, inviting people. I've been trying to, when I go out and eat with people, um, try and just have conversations with a waiter or waitress when I can and uh, have a little bit of fun with them, and at some point, invite them to church. I've been trying to do that, trying to make it a point in my mind, because I have to look for people um, to invite to church. Uh, Bring people to church, I think that's a great thing, but there's a lot of other ways that we can expand God's kingdom. Uh, First of all is in our family. Men, we're the spiritual leaders of our family. That's the position that God has, has put us in. And the deal with that is some of us are really good spiritual leaders and some of us are not so much. Some of us know what it means to be a spiritual leader and some of us have no idea where to even start. 
I can't tell you all the things that that, hap- that, that means, but I can tell you this, that at some point as, as the man, as a spiritual leader in the family, you have to lead in spiritual things, you know? Maybe taking your family to church and making sure that you do that. Maybe praying together as a family at night. Maybe doing a devotion together. Um, this last Thursday night, uh, our family went to hear Ravi Zacharias. Um, Ravi Zacharias is a Christian apologist, a defender of Christianity. And so our family went and listened to him on, on Thursday, and it was some really cool stuff. Uh, my son Bryson, you know, he loves science, and he loves all of the big words. And so as Ravi was teaching, there's uh, a lot of big words thrown out. And my, my son ate it up. He thought it was really cool. Um, but it was good for him uh, where he's going to school because it's out there. My daughter, <laughs> a lot of the stuff just went right over. You know, she didn't care. She's a junior high girl, just doesn't care about a lot of this stuff. So we had a conversation afterwards. I said, do you understand the importance of why this stuff was important? Do you understand how it relates to what you're dealing with in your school? And she said, no, I don't. I said, well, well you know, basically the deal is this. The, the people that are teaching in your school, the people that are teaching in college, they have a belief system that comes from this, that we just happen by accident. And so because we happen by accident, we ha- there is no accountability. We can live however we want. We can do whatever we want. So everything's right. And that's what they're going to teach from. And, and you're growing up in a house where we say that there is a God that made us and he cares about us, he cares what we do, and, and we're accountable to him for our actions. And because we're accountable to him for our actions, we can't just do whatever we want. Uh, there's consequences. And part of that consequence is, you know, we break the relationship with him. And, and because of the background, this is what we believe and this is why we teach. Now, in your school, you can't stop your teachers from teaching these things. In, in the TV shows that we watch, in the movies that we watch, you can't stop those things from being there. We just want you to be aware that those things are there. So that when you see the, the things that are being promoted in school and in the media and stuff like that, you see those things and you know what the truth of the Bible is. So you can fight against those things at least in your head. As a family, we went and watched and we had some conversations because I'm trying to be the spiritual leader of my family and, and deal with real life. Um, another great place to be to expand God's kingdom is at work. Now, something happened somewhere along church history line, and we started saying that there was religious jobs and there were secular jobs. I think preachers got a big head sometime and said, well, I've got the religious job, and I preach the gospel, and so it's much more spiritual than what all you guys do. And that's just bull. Okay? That's just junk. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, okay, the religious leader, okay, his work is so much more important than your job. And what happened when we did that is it started a separation in our minds to where I go to church on Sunday and I do my religious stuff, and at work, then I do all the secular stuff. And that's, that's just junk. All of our occupations have the potential to be religious. I don't care what it is you do. I mean, almost without exception, every job can be done for the glory of God. There's a couple jobs that probably don't. Um, But in general, the jobs that that we have can be done for the glory of God. And we we can be Christians who honor God in our workplace. We should be Christians who honor God in our workplace. Our actions, our words should make a difference. You know, for my family, um, this is my full-time occupation. My day off is on Friday. A, a year or two ago, we started doing a vending machine route on Fridays. So it's, it's every other Friday. It's just kind of to do something on the side. In our vending machine route, we try to act like Christians in that. And I'll tell you what, it's a pretty easy one to do. Because, you know, the job is when they see <laughs> the candy guy coming and showing up, they're like, oh, it's the candy guy. Okay, and we give them like a candy bar, and it's like the best thing that's happened to them all day. That 50 cent candy bar that someone gave them, oh my gosh, they just go crazy. But we start having conversations with those people that we see on a regular basis there. And I, and I tell them, I'm a full-time pastor, this is just something we do on the side, and we tell them, you know, uh, we, we tell them about the church and stuff like that, because I don't believe that there's a secular occupation. It, it, it's a part of who we are in every way. We are supposed to expand God's kingdom. Well, we expand God's kingdom when we seek after God's spirit. And we seek after God's spirit when we get the truth about who Jesus is. See how it all works together? 
And then there's this last part here next. Verse 9. <clears throat> After Jesus said this, he was taken up before the disciples' eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white, angels, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus, the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So I picture it like you, you let go of the helium balloon, you know, and you watch it as, as long as you can. I see Jesus going up in, into heaven, and the disciples are just like, wow, I can still see him. I can still, I, who put the cloud there? Move that thing out of the way. And they're paying all kinds of attention to the here, and these two angels come up and say, what are you doing? Stop looking up in the sky. When Jesus comes back, he's going to come in the sky. It's going to be big, and so you're not going to miss him, okay? So don't worry about that. Instead of just staring up in the sky, why don't you go do the stuff he told you to do? And I look at that and I think, you know, what about us? Instead of just looking up in the sky, God, thank you so much for our services on Sunday. Thank you for the stuff I learned. Awesome. And God's like, hey, why are you still looking up at me? Why don't you go do some of the stuff that we talked about? Why don't you put into practice this living at the faith? Why don't you put into practice seeking the Spirit? Instead of going home, guess what? There's no games on today. <laughs> Nothing of importance. The NFL doesn't start for another couple months. So instead of going home and just sitting and watching TV, why don't you go home and seek after the Spirit for half an hour? Why don't you try and connect with God in some fashion? Why don't you sit down and plan out what you could do this week to, to seek the Spirit or to expand God's kingdom? Why don't you go check out some websites if you still have issues about who Jesus is and you don't know all this stuff about him and you don't have a walk with him. Why don't you spend some time this afternoon online and just figuring out, man, what, is the, what does the Bible say about who Jesus is? Maybe read the Gospels. Read about Jesus and, and live this out. You know, I came across this t-shirt during spring training. I saw it in some restaurant here. It was uh, for all you Chicago Cubs fans. Um, do you know what Jesus told the Chicago Cubs before he went up to heaven? Don't do anything until I get back. And so, um, um, and they, they were obedient, so they're doing a good job there. You know what Jesus told us to do until he gets back? Expand his kingdom. How are we doing? Are we, are we more obedient than the Cubs are? I hope so. I hope so. You know, but before you can really be obedient to him, I, I, you probably need to know him. If you're someone that, that doesn't have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have people that will share with you from the Bible how you can start that relationship. If you're someone that's already there, you know what you need to do. I mean, we just talked about it. But if you don't know Jesus, that, that's the place to start. So every week we invite you to, to, to come up here. We have some people that will just talk to you back in the offices and just share with you. Man, this is where you start. So I just ask that everybody would stand up. And uh, if you want to talk to someone about uh, beginning a relationship with Jesus or, or you're dealing with something, you need someone to pray with you, why don't you come meet me up front as we sing this song?